I am so happy to be here today and talking back to sort of my roots. Um, for a long time, my career was completely inside of knowledge management with several other amazing people. I was able to start the Federal Knowledge Management Working Group, which um, we kind of led for 10 years before passing it on to others. And um, so it's really nice to be back here and talking about the ways in which I've seen knowledge management grow, our profession as knowledge management professionals, kind of where we've all come from and where we might all be heading. So I'm going to tell you today, I'm going to weave together technology and stories, which I think is kind of at the heart of what we do, um, and really making sure that the, all the great things we learned this week come back to helping to change people's behaviors. Because I think at the core of it that knowledge management is empowering people to make better decisions. So the work on taxonomies, and enterprise search, uh, we, I just came from a great talk on artificial intelligence. All of that really at the end of the day is helping people to make a better decision. Whether that decision is choosing what to watch on Netflix, whether that decision is choosing what might be a future for product development for your organization, or whether that decision is how to find a better education for your child. We as knowledge management professionals are giving people that information in a way that is actionable. So we've talked about a lot of different things this week. All of the workshops and the breakout sessions, the different tracks, the boot camps, they're talking about things like predictive analytics, artificial intelligence, machine learning, gamification, virtual and augmented reality. And today what I want to do is tell you a little bit about some of the work I've been doing both in the US and in Africa and how these come together when we talk about really different kinds of communities, when we talk about people who are sort of like us, very you know, embracing of technology, really understanding the complexities behind it, being able to get access to great services, but also talking about people at the other end of the spectrum who may not have those same privileges and may not have that same sort of access to the internet, to capabilities, and yet how we as professionals can help make them be the same kind of, uh, have the same kind of ability to create better decisions. So I'm going to touch briefly on these, but I'm not going to talk about these as topics. Instead, I'm going to talk about these technologies and capabilities in the context of how we actually can make changes in the environment or changes to people to give them better knowledge. So this is sort of the journey I think we're all on, right? When we start any kind of a knowledge management project, I feel like we're kind of around the campfire telling stories, telling future sense stories of where we could be. You know, what kind of things could we do if we only had this kind of information? If we had the data in real time to make better decisions? And yet, what we know everybody's expecting is that it's much more like the X-Men, right? That we have a neural chip in our brains that simply gives us all the information that we need in order to be able to make any decision. Somewhere along there, the big arrow at the bottom, that's us. <laughs> that's all of us trying to make it happen from the vision of the future to the reality. And we are all at different places along that journey, and our projects are all at different places along that journey. So who recognizes this map? Awesome, awesome. OK, this is by somebody named Jon Snow. Game of Thrones fans, it's not that Jon Snow. OK, in 1854, there was a cholera outbreak in London. Jon Snow was a doctor. And what he did is he said, there seems like there's a pattern. Like there's, there's got to be a reason why we're having this horrible epidemic of deaths around cholera. And so what he did is, one of the very first rudimentary visualizations around knowledge management, he put together a map. And so these are the streets of London at the time. And each red dot represents a death of cholera. And then he started to put it together. And he created this sort of contour map around it and realized that it wasn't random, right? Cholera wasn't, as, as the time was thought, created by ethers, sort of vapors, invisible vapors in the air. But in fact, when he did that map, he realized it was related to a specific well. It was a water well that had been contaminated, and they found out why. And that contaminated water spread out. So the closer you lived to the well, the more likely you were to draw water from the well, the more likely you were to die of cholera. So we go from maps like this to maps like this. So who recognizes this? Oh, good. I just found it myself. <laughs> so this is very new. This is from a new product from Google called DeepMind. So DeepMind is a machine learning and artificial intelligence 
that's using, really sort of exploring the edges of artificial intelligence as we know it today. And this product is actually called Deep Dreams. So this map is one where they, they give a visual image to a computer and they ask it to sort of enhance its understanding of the patterns in that image. And so although this kind of looks like, I mean, it, some of you might have been looking for, is, you know, is this an impressionist art? <laughs> is this some kind of, you know, beautiful uh, Van Gogh? But actually what it is, is just a simple image that has been highly enhanced almost in an artistic way by a computer who's looking for patterns where there may or may not be patterns, but taking those things that it could assess as patterns and enhancing them. So we end up with these beautiful pieces of art for which there is almost no human intervention. There was an initial image, but beyond that, it's just this kind of an idea about where the future might go when we think of the visualizations like this, and now we think of visualizations like this. So how does this all make sense? Well, the one thing we need to do is make sure that as knowledge management professionals, that we don't end up where we're working on old technologies. <laughs> so at some point, the things that we think of as essential today and as very current are going to feel very old school. And we want to always be sort of in that leading edge, understanding where new technologies can help us to better serve our customers. So as we think about the things we've learned this week, the conversations we've had, the networks we've made, the new friends we've made, those conversations lead us to think about new information. The data that we have at organizations helps us to start to understand new types of trends, new types of analysis. And the thing to know is that data is being gathered every moment of every day, whether you know it or not. So how many people here have a mobile phone? Awesome. So chances are you're being tracked right now. I know I'm being tracked because I use an application called Waze. So Waze is a traffic application. I don't know if you've ever heard. The city of Los Angeles has horrible traffic. Uh, and so we use this great application, which millions of other people use. But unfortunately, what it does is it also tracks your whereabouts at all times because part of the way it gathers data about traffic patterns is it always looks at how fast people are moving and it assesses if you're moving fast enough to be in a vehicle, then it wants to always know kind of the, the uh, rapidity of traffic on that street. So I'm always being tracked. I give up that privacy, not entirely voluntarily, but because traffic's so bad and it helps me save time, I give up that privacy to a company I know very little about in order to gain a benefit. But there are other things that we're observed on every day. Again, we may or may not uh, willingly give up our privacy. Things that we publish on the internet. So, although we feel very secure in our little Facebook groups and our Facebook friends, those postings are seen by lots and lots and lots of different companies and used by Facebook to sell ads to lots and lots of different companies. So every minute online, there are 571 new websites being developed. Okay, so there are a few people in the room who might be as old as I am. I remember in the days when like there were 571 sites on the web. And so we think about that, 347 new blogs posted every minute. 48 hours of YouTube video posted every minute. So this kind of data deluge, huge amounts of information, every time we see something, we spend a moment on it, we like it, we don't like it, we move past it quickly, we linger, all of that action is being tracked, both online and then our actions in real space. So when you go out on, so I manage a lot of infrastructure for the city of Los Angeles, and I lived here in Washington for a long time. When you walk out on the streets, look up and look around. Look at all of the cameras, all of the devices, the fact that other people, every single member here has a mobile phone, and some of those mobile phones are also gathering information about other mobile phones nearby. Up on street lights, you'll see that there are cellular devices. Some of those help with the city to provide, provide broadband and Wi-Fi access, but some of them are also looking for other things. So I don't mean to get y'all scared, but every day we are being observed online and in person in many, many different ways, some of which we're cognizant of, some of which we're not. When we flip that conversation around, though, that can also be a huge advantage for us as knowledge management professionals. That data is being gathered. Sometimes it's being used, but it's being gathered somewhere. 
if we think that it could be useful to us, useful to our customers, useful to our organizations, there may be a way to access some of that data and being able to use it for good. So I'm going to talk about this in the context of places where about 80% of us live. So 80% of the world's population lives in urban areas like cities. So I'm going to talk about my hometown, which is the city of Los Angeles. And I love working there. I worked in federal government for 34 years, and now I'm really happy to be working in local government because I get to actually do stuff that I see change things every day. Just recently, I did a project where we provided free Wi-Fi to some of our homeless encampments. And every day, I can drive by Skid Row or walk around there and be able to see people getting online and connecting with their families, being able to look for jobs, being able to get access to shelters. And I love local government. But Los Angeles is a huge place. Four million people live in the city. It's 470 square miles. 220 languages are spoken there. So when you think about putting up a website, it's one thing to put up English, English and Spanish. Actually, I have to put it up in 17 languages just to hit our core demographic. And 220 languages, I want to make sure I'm hitting everybody. So when we think about this, how do we manage that kind of knowledge? Well, underneath it, there's a whole set of activities, many of which we've talked about here. Things like enterprise search and content management. We have taxonomies. We use metadata standards. So the kinds of things that we've talked about, the kinds of things that we're challenged with, are helping us to provide better, more efficient, more effective, more resilient services as a city, and to really kind of build up the whole ecosystem. Because again, at the end of the day, it's one thing to have data, information, even actionable knowledge. But if we don't drive people to action, if we don't get them to do something with that information, then we don't actually affect change. So one of the things we do to make that happen is we have an open data portal. Many cities do this. This is what I did for six years with the Obama administration, is built data.gov. Um, and that was a great project. Brought together 500,000 data sets from 174 different um, uh, federal agencies. And many cities, like Los Angeles, have open data portals. We organize that with a pretty rigorous taxonomy underneath to be able to let people understand of the 1,200 data sets we have here, things that are related to economic development, things that are related to public health, um, transportation, the city budget. So different things that make sense to people rather than necessarily all the taxonomical elements that are the ways in which we organize it. We also have a portion that takes that data and pulls it out. So this is part of our open a government and transparency aspect. In this case, we wanted to show financial indicators that are things that people could understand. Now, rather than give them spreadsheets or APIs to the data, we actually said maybe they just want to know the number of affordable housing units. Maybe they just want to know our unemployment rate, or actually employment rate. We have very, very low unemployment in Los Angeles. Um, maybe they just want to understand how many new jobs were created and how many jobs were created in green tech and clean tech. So we show dashboards like this, pulling real-time data out of our open data portal so that we can be transparent about areas where we're improving and areas where we need to improve. We also have mobile applications. Is it mobile applications, there's two sides to that. So everybody wants to, whenever they have a new project, they want to go mobile. And I don't know if you guys have heard this from customers or from your organizations. We need a mobile app for that. We need a mobile app for that. I keep hearing that. But in fact, it's really difficult because you have to get people to download that mobile app. Now that chart I flashed by a, little, a few minutes ago, like what happens every minute, Every minute, 47,000 downloads happen from the Apple Store of mobile apps. So I mean, there are a lot of mobile apps being downloaded, but that's not necessarily 47,000 copies of your mobile app. So sometimes a mobile app works well. Here's one example where we, we did well at the city of Los Angeles. This is a service called 311. So 311 is like 911. You can just call the three numbers on your, on your phone and be able to get access to city services. And I actually oversee this service as part of my day job. And so in this case, what we're doing is we put together 72 different kinds of service requests from across the city. Things like, I'm not getting paid minimum wage. There's a dead horse in front of my house. The pot, well, we can, we can even tell if there's a dead llama. I don't know how many dead llamas there have been in the city of Los Angeles that needed to be picked up. But, um, but we have that in our taxonomy. 
Um, we also, uh, potholes that need to be fixed, graffiti that needs to be um, written over, uh, and all of these different kinds of services, people can call, and we get about a million phone calls a year. Um, so that's a great call center. It's very interesting to hear all the different calls that come in each day. And then we also have a mobile app that handles another half a million requests. And so this works really well for things like graffiti removal and potholes where there's a GPS location. So I can snap a picture of the pothole, send it in, it automatically says it's a big pothole, where it is, what kind of street um, surfacing there is. And so that makes it really easy to be able to connect all of this. And then we also think about getting the data. So, so this is useful in that people, it's actionable, right? You get the mobile app, you're trying to fix something, maybe you're trying to tag graffiti. We actually ping that dynamically against our cultural arts database. One person's graffiti is another person's art. <laughs> and so if somebody's already tagged it as art, we won't paint over it and we'll respond appropriately. But it's actionable, right? So this is data and information, but it's actionable. We also have something else in California. We have four seasons. You guys have four seasons, yeah? I hear you have winter, spring, summer, and fall. We have fire, flood, earthquake, and drought. So this is about our earthquake season. And so the earthquakes in California are, as you might expect, pretty much unpredictable. There are slight patterns, but it doesn't really give us enough to predict when the earthquake's gonna come. But what we can do is we can tell that an earthquake is coming if it's started. So, you know, earthquake, deep rumbling in the ground, and then it reaches the surface, and that's where all the damage occurs. But when that deep rumbling in the ground starts, we actually have 20,000 sensors all up and down the western coast of uh, the United States. We work with the US Geological Survey. And those sensors catch that first deep rumbling, sends a radio signal out. And that radio signal beats the ground waves, which are very slow. And so we can actually, on a mobile app, give people one to two minutes warning that an earthquake's coming. Okay, you might not think that's much, right? Okay, but in one to two minutes, we could certainly get out of this level of this hotel. <laughs> this is probably not the place we want to be during an earthquake. If we could get up to street level, that would be better. If I was a doctor in an operating room, I could pull out stop the operation, put that person in a stable situation. If I'm a fire captain in Los Angeles, I could open the firehouse doors, because if the building gets damaged, I want to get my fire trucks out. If I'm operating at the port of Los Angeles, I want to take those cranes that are taking the big containers off the boats, I want to lock those cranes up and away from the ships so the ships can flow out. Truly not that I care so much about those ships, but I really care about getting other ships in and out of the port after an earthquake because that's going to be the way in which we're going to be able to get supplies to people. So having one to two minutes warning, especially because we've been able to automate this through an API, which means I can automatically raise those firehouse doors. There's no human intervention needed. I can automatically lock and load the cranes. I can automatically um, put out a public announcement over the systems in a bunch of city buildings all at once that says duck and cover. So that gives me a huge amount of actionable knowledge, right? I can tell people what to do, and the app itself flashes up a warning of what you should do, how severe the shaking's going to be, and um, when you can expect a shaking. The other thing that's very actionable in a far off way is autonomous vehicles. Right, okay, so this is like truth or dare, truth. How many people expect that you'll see autonomous vehicles on the streets of Washington, D.C. in the next 20 years? Okay, keep your hands up if you believe it'll be the next five years. Okay, who, who believes it'll be in the next two years? All right, you're my true believers, my friends. Okay, so autonomous vehicles are gonna change the face of urban areas where 80% of us live. They're gonna change it dramatically. Now you may think, well, it's just a self-driving car. And yeah, I mean, that's kind of true. It's not so much what happens when you're in the car, it's what happens when you get out of the car. So if I pull up to a place here in Washington, so I'm going to the Caps game tomorrow night, all right? Love hockey. I will not say if I'm rooting for the Penguins or the Caps, but I will say that I'm going to the game. So if I drive my rental car over there and I park on the street, I'm taking up a parking space for four or five hours. And I, I might be paying, you know, there might be a meter on the street at the time, but that four or five hours means that that curb space 
is dedicated just to me. When in fact it could be 50 Uber drivers and Lyft drivers dropping people off, it could be three trucks coming in to deliver stuff. That, that space, that, that urban space could be used in many different ways. When we have autonomous vehicles, when my car drops me off, I walk out and my car then goes to remote location and just kind of settles itself. Or maybe I have a, a service where now that car is going around picking up other people during that time. I'm not using that space. It's just as convenient to me, but I'm not using that space. And so autonomous vehicles will change parking regulations. They'll change the use of curb space. They'll change city planning. The data we get from these autonomous vehicles and the data we're starting to already get from Ford and Tesla and Toyota and then Volvo and other manufacturers is helping to inform us on how and when we need to construct new roadways, um, traffic safety for uh, different groups of pedestrians and bicyclists, and really helping to make it actionable for us as a city to change the urban landscape in ways which become much more people friendly and less car friendly. We don't really want to have a city designed around cars, but that's in fact what we have in most urban cities. One of the interesting pieces that we're doing here, very much a knowledge management piece, is working with one of our local universities to try to count the number of pedestrians and bicyclists that are going up and down our roadways. So we know that we have about 250 fatalities in traffic each year in Los Angeles. Given the number of vehicles, you may not think that's, a, that's that much, but in fact, 250 lives cut short. How could we fix that? What we realize is while we have a lot of ways to count cars, we integrate with Waze and we share data with that traffic application I mentioned earlier. We can count them through sensors in the ground. I mean, cars are big things and they move in predictable ways. What's less predictable and harder to count are people walking by, especially when there's a group of people and they kind of weave in and out of each other. They cross behind trees bicyclists going up and down the bike lanes or kind of in and out of traffic. And traditionally what we've done is a really silly thing, but what every city does is we have somebody watching video. One, two, three, four. <laughs> Literally tallying by hand the number of pedestrians and bicyclists. So instead what we've done is we've said, look, the actionable knowledge, right? The actual knowledge of that is we want to create safer spaces for people walking and biking. We don't want to create jobs for people tallying things by hand. And so you, working with Cal State LA, we created an algorithm that looks at the images we get from these really bad traffic cameras, like these fisheye lenses and bad lighting. It's only really meant to look in the intersection in case there was an accident and be able to look retroactively. Instead, what we did we found ways using different kinds of filtering techniques to create an algorithm that automatically counts with 100% accuracy those pedestrians and bicyclists in real time and feeds it into our automated traffic system. So now when there's a World Series, my heart is still breaking. Go Astros. Um, so when there's a World Series at Dodger Stadium, we have a ton of people walking through or the Olympics coming in 2028. And suddenly in an intersection which historically has very little traffic of pedestrians and so they have almost no time to cross the street because it's optimized for cars. Now we can optimize dynamically for the number of people walking through that area. As areas of the city are gentrified and, and uh, changed over from sort of vehicle centric to people centric, we can change the traffic lights and the walk lanes and replan for bike lanes and safety. So we're using really interesting technologies in order to be able to create more actionable knowledge. And the other thing we do is we, we realize that at the end of the day, this data has to drive the kinds of behaviors that we want. So we've all rolled out systems. I mean, I will fess up to the issues around lessons learned systems at NASA. We've all rolled out systems where we put forth knowledge and we're sure people are gonna behave a certain way and they behave completely differently. So at NASA, we put up a lessons learned system we wanted people to publish lots of lessons learned. We gave them a financial incentive to do so. And what we got was the same lesson kind of published over and over again. <laughs> Variations on a theme. They were, they were legitimately different lessons, but it was really not the kind of behavior that we expected. So in the area of climate change, when the US pulled out of the Paris Climate Accord, uh, my boss, Mayor Eric Garcetti of Los Angeles, led a coalition of now 382 other mayors to step forward to uphold the Paris Climate Accords for their cities. Thank you. 
a scientist in the room. <laughs> Um, and I'm just saying, from NASA, I was there 32 years, and from NASA, you know, the climate science is pretty clear. So, so we said as cities that in our area, we were going to continue to work towards the agreements in the Paris Accord. And the reason we wanted to do that is because we knew that change in climate was happening and that humans could make a difference in the change. And this is one of the reasons why I know this. So growing up in Los Angeles, this is what the city looked like over here on the left. So who, as a kid, had a, a snow day? You got to stay home from school, right? It was just like, it's not, the weather was horrible, it was kind of cool, it was fun. Okay, we had smog days. Like legitimately, school was closed because the air was so unbreathable in the 60s and the 70s that it was unsafe for kids to walk to school. Okay, it was really unsafe to be in the city, but it was unsafe for kids to walk to school, it was unsafe for us to be on the playground, and so we stayed home from school. And then LA looks like the other side now. And the reason is because we worked with individuals and we worked with companies to make changes that over time we, we sort of iterated till we got it right that would decrease the air pollution in Los Angeles. And one of the biggest indicators was not us telling individuals we're gonna raise the price of gas, or we're gonna make it more difficult to get gas, or we're trying to like change individuals. Instead, actually, we worked with businesses and we put the onus on the business to decrease the number of daily commutes of their people. So a lot of businesses in Los Angeles went to what we call a 980 work week, where you get every other Friday off, or every other Monday, or every other Wednesday, whichever you choose. It cuts down the number of trips. So employees still work 80 hours in two weeks. They work it slightly differently. And then co uh, companies also incentivize carpooling. And they found creative ways that worked for them at sort of a super microcosm to make the changes in behavior that the data told us would help us to get better air quality. And then we realized that not everybody sort of ha listens and understands and learns and interacts the same way. So we are trying lots of new technologies. Um, some of these actually help to address our ADA concerns. So Americans with Disabilities Act and making sure that people get access to information in different ways. So at the top there we have Alexa, which is um, the Amazon Echo, so you can just kind of Shout out if you have one of these in your home, which I think is a little creepy. Um, if you, have, you can just shout out, hey, city of Los Angeles, how do I pay my parking ticket? Number one complaint at the city. Uh, and, uh, and it'll tell you. Or, hey, Los Angeles, I'm interested in doing something fun this weekend. What's going on? And we'll tell you about events in your neighborhood. Um, and then at the bottom, we're also using uh, chatbots on a lot of our websites now, and even in some of our mobile applications to try to help answer Lots of questions. With four million people, we get a lot of phone calls. <laughs> we get a lot of questions asked. We also work with a bigger ecosystem. So again, when I think about trying to change things in Los Angeles, I'm trying to think about how to change the behaviors of four million people to be more cohesive, to change in whatever way that people want to move the city forward. So part of that is opening up our data, not just to other city departments, not just to businesses, but actually to civic hackers. So these are white hat hackers, the good kind of hackers. And so our local group is called Hack for LA. It's part of the larger group called Code for America. They're a wonderful organization. They're in many, many cities across the, the country, and there's a variation on the international side. So Hack for LA meets twice a week, different parts of the city, and we've been doing that for about a year and a half. And we work on different things that people come forward as projects that they care about. So there's a project on food deserts. How do we get access to clean, good, healthy food in our underserved neighborhoods where it's really hard to get food? Um, how do we make sure that we have uh, support for the homeless? How do we make sure that we are you know, doing things that are looking toward, forward towards the city? And then I also created, when I started uh, last year at the city, I created a data science federation. So I've been teaching for about 20 years at UCLA. And um, reached out to all of the other data science and organizational uh, folks teaching across the city. And so we now have 14 universities and colleges that work with the city. And the first year, we brought 200 students through the program. We've hired about 10% of them already. Not all of them have graduated yet. <laughs> so my ulterior motive is to get young people with fresh ideas into city government. And the other problem is trying to really get that change in um, understanding, change the behavior of city employees to think new and different ways. Um, so we use the ideas 
behind knowledge management of taxonomies and structures and pulling data together and federating that and putting them into organizational systems, looking at learning management to really change the direction of the city and especially around some of our most difficult problems. One of those problems is homelessness. So we are not the city with the highest number of homeless, but that's only because New York holds that um, dubious honor. Uh, but we do have the largest number of people who live unsheltered every night on our streets. 30,000 people sleep on the streets of Los Angeles each night. So how do we try and figure that out? How do we solve that problem? Last year, we had less than that, and we housed 10,000 people that were homeless, and we still had a higher number this year. So instead of just thinking about the end and dealing with people who are in crisis, we started thinking about the beginning end of that. How can we predict, how can we use predictive analytics to decide who is at risk of falling into homelessness and who we could help to sort of change the direction? And so what we've done is we've worked with all of the different centers around the city where people come when they need workforce training, when their families are in crisis, when they need economic help, they come to one of these centers to get some support and services. We ask them a few questions, things like, is somebody in your family sick right now? Um, do you have a strong social network here? The kinds of things that might give them a higher risk of being homeless based upon a meta-analysis that we did of lots of different um, literature. And now what we can do is we can start to give them extra support and services when they first come in. Even if they're not homeless, we can help them with their rent for a few months. We can give them a shelter voucher. We can give them extra workforce training. We can get them covered under Covered California for health insurance so that we can make sure that they stay on the track of staying housed, that their family doesn't fall into crisis. And we actually economically spend less doing that kind of intervention than trying to help somebody at the tragic end of being homeless. So at the end of the day, it sounds like things are rocking. It sounds like there's lots of things going on with knowledge management, but we're still in the same situation that many of you find yourselves time after time on projects where the end vision is not necessarily coming to fruition. And part of that is because we have a bit of a paradigm shift. It's that issue I talked about where, you know, we have a lot of people who are connected and we have a lot of people who are thinking about technology, just as in all other cities, but there are people who are also disconnected. So we have the homeless population. 25% of the people in Los Angeles live under the poverty level. Now we have a very, very, very low unemployment. We have high employment, the highest ever job growth, and yet people aren't making enough to get by. And partly that's because of the cost of housing in LA. And we know this map shows that yellow area in the middle, which is uh, an area called South LA and Watts, some of our poor neighborhoods, the number of people having access to internet at home is decreasing over time rather than increasing. So some of the more affluent neighborhoods on the outskirts like most, like most places around the world, we're getting better and better access to the internet. Those internal areas are not. And so we have to start thinking differently about things like digital inclusion. So for those, this is shout out to all those from library science and information sciences in the room. The libraries at um, the city of Los Angeles are awesome partners in our efforts around digital inclusion. So we do a lot of things around connectivity with public-private partnerships in organizations like Verizon and AT&T and T-Mobile and Sprint and all of the big telecommunication providers because they need to build out their networks using our city assets. So when you go out in the streets and you start looking up and around, you'll see these small cell devices on street lights and power poles. And those are actually private sector devices that help to give us better access to the internet. But from a public perspective, we rent those out to those companies at a relatively small cost. And what we want to do is then also say, when you do that in areas where we have really poor neighborhoods, we would like you to do that at a lower cost or for free to a women's domestic violence shelter or for free to our LA fire department over there or for free to this encampment of homeless people on Skid Row. Our library has a program we've partnered with called tech to go So you all know you can go to a library, check out a book. You can also check out a month of the internet. So we check out Wi-Fi hotspots and let people take those home to be able to get access. And then because they don't always have a device to access it, we have a program called R-Cycle LA, which I oversee. And R-Cycle takes old city computers, gets kids from the neighborhoods, teaches them skills to, uh, on the hardware and software to refurbish those computers, and then we give them away. 
We give them away to low-income seniors, to low-income housing, to families in crisis, to victims of domestic violence. Um, we are doing one today to actually people who are just coming out of a, of a rehabilitation program after uh, being in prison and have kind of like gotten on the straight and narrow, and so they're now back in school, and we're giving them computers um, this, today in City Hall. And then the other thing our library does, which I think is the cutest program in the city, is that on their first day of kindergarten, so we have 650,000 kids in the LA Unified School District. It's a lot of kids. <laughs> but on the first day of kindergarten, when they come into the classroom, they're greeted by their teacher, and they're given a library card. So that library card is their access to a ton of services uh, and ongoing lifelong learning capabilities so that they always have access to the knowledge that they need. And I love this program because it means it's not just about sort of traditional library services, but digital literacy too. It helps them and it helps their families get access to those kinds of services. And the kinds of things that are happening in our libraries are amazing. So we have these things called maker spaces. So maker spaces let you build robots, let you use 3D printers, let you get access to new tech skills that you might not have gotten access to before. And so we get these great groups of people and we're actually creating citizen scientists. So these are people who not only have new tech skills to go get jobs, but also can help us by gathering data around the city. And when I say citizen science, maybe you're thinking of somebody like this. Right, so this is Doc Brown from Back to the Future, an awesome citizen scientist. But no, we're actually talking more about people like this. So this is a group of our young girls in the city, and they're using their mobile phones to play a game called Agents of Discovery. And Agents of Discovery is augmented reality. All right, so we're gamifying their exploration of the physical world. We're getting them up and out of their houses. We're getting them to explore, I think these girls right here, are on an agents of water tour and they're in a space trying to find the leaky faucet and turn off the leaky sprinkler and so they're actually out looking at how we can save water better. And one of our four seasons, is, sorry, one of our four seasons is drought, so we're always thinking about water. Um, and then the other kinds of missions we have is looking at flora and fauna, trying to discover different animals in the parks. We just launched a new um, gamification around City Hall. And when they're out there gathering this uh, information, they're also gathering data and sharing that data back to the city. Part of this builds on something that's available to everybody called the Federal Citizen Science uh, Toolkit. So this is a great, organ a great uh, toolkit available, built by a bunch of folks around the federal government that lets us take sort of basic science gathering that might be happening from non-scientists, right? These girls were probably not PhDs. Um, and then puts it together in a way which other scientists with more rigorous expectations can make it happen. So it helps us to combine those citizen science activities with regular government science in ways that give us more meaningful data. So this is a group of citizen scientists that I helped to start at NASA called the Data Knots. It's an all women's group of data scientists. These are not traditionally data people, but what we realized is when we started holding data jams and hackathons, that the women coming to the groups were more hesitant to get started and like jump right in. And so what we've done is we've organized different cohorts of, of, of women who are interested in this and then we can help them get training in advance so that they're kind of spun up really quick. And we've used, I've used the same methodology several other times. So this is a great group of data scientists. Um, these are my students. So a couple years ago, I took my classes out of UCLA and I brought them into the neighborhoods of Los Angeles. And we give the class for free. It's called Transforming Your Community. And they have to come with an idea about how to make life better in their neighborhood. And so these kids are homeless. They're just coming out of prison. They're going through recovery programs. They are not traditional UCLA students, but they are students because they want to learn and they want to improve things. And we use really sophisticated tools. Can you see the Legos in the front? <laughs> okay, so Legos are a great community organizing event because it helps them like formalize the physicality of the data, the ideas of what they want to do. These kids were working on a park. They wanted to improve the parks in their neighborhood. But in order to, to graduate, they don't have to have um, an exam. What they have to do is they have to go through a dolphin tank, not a shark tank, a dolphin tank. 
And the Dolphin Tank is a really friendly group of people who looks and gives constructive criticism back to the project. And they have to show a map. They have to do a visualization like Jon Snow of where this data is going to have an impact. They have to do demographic data analysis. These are people who've never seen an Excel spreadsheet. And then they have to look through and say, what are the outcomes and how will we measure the effectiveness of this project? So it's been an amazing um, opportunity to learn from these um, young kids. And then the last thing is really this group I started in Africa called the Africa Open Data Conference and Collaborative, where um, in, first with the World Bank and now as a nonprofit, we pull together hundreds and hundreds of people multiple times a year from across the continent to pull together people who are working in data science, information science, knowledge management. Um, there's a lot about records management that this group talks about in areas where we don't have electronic systems and we're really working from paper records. So really kind of the whole evolution and the grounding I had in knowledge management has been useful in working with this group. This is a group of 450 folks who got together in Tanzania and just last July we had another 700 in Ghana. So at the end of the day, we talk about all of these things we can do in developed nations, but we can also do things in, in developing nations. So these are the sustainable development goals stepped up to by 190 countries across the world to end poverty, change the face of hunger, make equity happen better. So this is my friend Nampira outside of Kampala, Uganda. And she's a farmer, and she just wants the same thing we all want. She wants her family to be happy, she wants her kids to grow up healthy, and she wants to be successful at her farm. And so what she needs is she needs water. But that water she has is not clean. It's not good for her crops, and it's not good for her kids. So she doesn't know how to use data, but she does have a mobile phone. So we work with organizations like NASA, where we get satellite imagery of different places to dig for water points, work with Matt Damon's organization called Life for Water, and be able to look at how nonprofits can come in and drill those water points. And we start to get water out to the farmers, like Nampira, and be able to get her the water she needs to make a difference. And she can use that mobile phone to also be a data scientist and a citizen scientist. Here we had a banana blight outside at, in Uganda. We used the radio to communicate to farmers and ask them if they had the blight, which we described, take a picture, go to the village center, and send it in. And that picture we did machine learning against, so we could determine where all of the blight was. And then we could send government out with pesticides to be able to save the crop. And they were able to save about 85% of the crop that year. And then when I went to market with Nampira, I thought she would be like exchanging big piles of cash. They used um, shillings there. And instead, she was just like moving her mobile phone around. I'm like, what are you doing? Like, are you, did you get a fair price for your crop? And she looked at me like I was crazy. And she's like, M-Pesa. And M-Pesa is a mobile money service. And so using this information, she's able to get the money securely and save it. Save it in a way which lets her save up for things she couldn't save before, like sending her daughter to, to school. At the end of the day, Nampira didn't change her culture. She didn't change her technology. She didn't have to buy something new. She had to be open to learning. She had to be given actionable knowledge in ways that made sense to her. And at the end of the day, all of the ecosystem around her had to help to make sure that together they moved forward, that there was access to water, there was access to food, there was access to mobile money, there was safety in what she was trying to do. And so at the end of the day, what we're really trying to do is again, empower people with the information they need to make better decisions. And I know that's what you guys do each and every day. Each and every day you're doing that in small systems and big systems, through storytelling, through different aspects of knowledge management. And each of you ends up using some of these different kinds of aspects as we think towards the future of knowledge management. Whether we're using harnessing um, search to be able to unleash new technologies and new information, using AI to replace human databases and human information, thinking about digital inclusion, and each of you becomes a hero every day to people by giving them better information in order to make better decisions. So I just really appreciate what you guys do. I appreciate the difference that you're making every day. And think big and be brave and go forth and share the knowledge. <laughs>